for our project, we worked with the friction stir welding, which in essence we want to heat the rod from room temperature to 400 degrees so that it's a lot easier to put in the metal and begin stirring. Uh, that's the, to simulate this, we created a file, uh, a MATLAB file, in which we took the rod and basically broke it up into a hundred quarters. And by doing this, we were able to find the area and, and see exactly how the heat transfer was, was occurring. And what we did is we, we used a heating rod to, or a heating rod. An energy balance. Yeah, to, well. to heat up the rod at one end and see how long it would take to reach 400 degrees at the opposite end. Uh, this was done using various energy balances, uh, basic heat transfer modeling. And what we ended up seeing is that using the stainless steel metal that we chose, uh, it was impossible to reach 400 degrees at the other end of the rod uh, in a reasonable time. Our, our time that we wanted was about two minutes to reach steady state uh, before we would start the stirring. And to simulate this, we, we did some doublet tests, gathered the data, and threw it into Loop Pro to gain some, some tuning parameters in hopes that we could find a controller that would allow us to reach the, the steady state value of 400 degrees Celsius in time. Uh, once we threw it into Loop Pro, we got tuning parameters for two different uh, temperature ranges. This is very low temperature range from 50 to 100 to 0 degrees Celsius, and the other is uh, from 1400 to 600 degrees Celsius. And as you can see, the, the tuning parameters for both are exactly the same, which leads us to believe that this is a linear process. And so, as you notice with these tuning parameters, um, there's a really high dead time. Uh, it's not higher than the tau, but it's still substantial. I, and if our goal is two, two minutes worth of, of time to get it to 400 degrees steady state, that's definitely going to be a, a, a big challenge to, to get that to steady state in, in, the, in a reasonable amount of time. So our first attempt was with a PID controller. And the closest we could get with a PID controller was at about 1,500 seconds, which is nowhere near our two minutes. So what we decided to do instead is in, instead of doing a, a PI, PI controller, we decided to go with a PI controller with a Smith predictor. And what the Smith predictor does, here is our process um, parameters, our process tra uh, transfer function with our our theta, our dead time here. And here is the process with our, our theta. And what that does is it actually is, this is an ideal process if there was no dead time. And that subtracts that out of the dead time out of that process and adds it in. And it, the collective effect of a Smith predictor essentially is that what actually comes back to the controller is the difference between the set point and a prediction of the measured process variable if there were no dead time. So an ideal state, um, uh, the, the actual state minus an ideal. And so what that in turn does is, is decreases the dead time in the predictor. And so we thought this would have uh, a, a better effect than the PI, and it did. We, we, were, we started seeing success right away, much, much better results. Um, and we got to about uh, somewhere in the range of three to five minutes with the predictor, um, and I'll let Jared take it from there. So once we had built our predictor, um, this predictor and the PID controller are both based off of the original steel rod that we had. And that steel rod may not always be the same. It may break, um, it may be ground down to nothing, it may change sizes, you may build a new machine and need a new rod. And so what we did is we took the same Smith predictor, and we retuned the PID, the PI controller, and um, kept these constants the same from the original rod. 
but changed the actual bar, which is represented right here, um, by all of its parameters by 5% up and 5% down to represent changes in um, the bar that we had. And these are the results that we had. This first graph right here represents the time to steady state. The green one on the top is the normal bar, the original bar that we had. The red bar is the with plus 5% um, deviation in the bar. And then the blue is the minus 5% deviation in the bar itself. Uh, and all three reach steady state. The green one is a little better than it's the original. Reading such state steady about 400 seconds. The other two take another 50 or 100 seconds to reach that steady state. The second graph on here is the heating element itself. Again, the green is normal, and then the red is minus 5, and the blue is plus 5. We wanted to see uh, what the heating element was doing, because we don't want the heating element to be turning on and off really quickly, or turning on for a long period of time, and turning off for a long period of time, and then turning on. And as you can see, they are all relatively uh, similar. The green one, again, is very smooth. And that represents, that's just because it's the original bar. The, bl the blue and the red are a little bit different just because it's taking into account the differences between the um, controller itself and the bar uh, parameters. So all together, and it's, uh, it works pretty well, and we're confident this will work for any uh, friction stir welder you have that has a steel bar of about the same size. We didn't quite reach our two minute mark that we were we were wanting, but but it's still in a reasonable amount of time, so we think we, we accomplished what we were setting up for.